Cool. Here you are, guys. Thank you guys for staying. I know that uh, the weather is very nice outside and sunlight is limited. Um, so we have uh, four projects up on stage. You've heard them present. Um, there are some uh, similarities between, but not across necessarily all four, although they exist in the same family. So I'm going to lead off with a few uh, comparison questions, but divide them up here. To the inter-blockchain communication projects, um, there's the obvious, uh, Polkadot and Cosmos. Could you speak uh, together, uh, one and two, two and one, a little bit about the differences between uh, the projects, shared security versus independent security, uh, and will, do you think, over time, these be collaborative or competitive, uh, so on and so forth? So, yeah, I'll, um, thank you for the question. Um, so, like you mentioned, that the most important difference between uh, Polkadot and Cosmos is the uh, shared security and the independent security uh, side of things. And then the second part is uh, upgradable chains, the on-chain governance part of it. Uh, basically, the way we see it is uh, that shared security is needed is uh, the way because... Um, one chain should not be competing with the other chain about security resources. They should not be uh, basically uh, like doing the exact same thing with respect to stake or with respect to mining or something. Um, they should be collaborating on that scale and helping each other become more secure. So if you are attacking a chain uh, on uh, Polkadot or Parachain, you are actually attacking the whole network and not just that particular chain. And secondly, the uh, other major difference is the upgradable uh, uh, runtimes and the blockchain uh, with, with respect to the on-chain governance is um, nothing is permanent. Uh, there has to be uh, an uh, option to upgrade things. We are looking at uh, right now, there are so many use cases where we have to uh, each and every day upgrade the smart contracts or upgrade the business logic or runtimes and everything. And then there is this huge uh, disruption of process happening because of that. And we want to get rid of that whole problem by providing an on-chain upgrade uh, solution. So that's basically uh, the way I see is, is the, uh, the two major points of differences between Cosmos and Polkadot and why they are there, uh, why these we are providing these kind of uh, solutions with Polkadot. And I'll let Billy add to it. Sure, thank you. Um, so I, I understand why the comparison's made often. In a way, we're solving similar problems. Uh, but I think actually we're providing different solutions for different scenarios. Um, Polkadot wants to be a very large shared environment, which has its benefits um, and also has its drawbacks. Uh, we kind of take the approach that uh, sovereignty is the most important aspect of any application-specific blockchain. And so we make that the, the first available aspect of it. When it comes to shared security, uh, we also um, try to avoid using this term. Uh, we think it kind of a misnomer. What we like to call it is cross-chain collateralization which is entirely possible and probably going to occur soon on Cosmos. And what that means basically is that, uh, so there's chain A, let's call it Cosmos Hub, which has an atom used for staking. Chain B could also use atom for staking uh, as long as it's allowed to enact slashing conditions on that chain A's asset. So if that were allowable, then any of those validators which have atoms securing chain A would be able to use those atoms to secure chain B as well. Uh, this is basically uh, an agreement that those validators need to come to with the second chain, which is, again, how we kind of see things happening. There's no reason you should be forced to secure a chain that you don't agree with. There's no reason that you should be forced to support something whose resources are draining on an otherwise productive ecosystem. All of these things, we believe, should be sort of autonomous and taken care of by sovereign chains. I'm also sure that you'll have responses to each other. So we'll come back to a similar question a bit later on that will provide an opportunity there. But to the graph and chain, like, this is sort of a similar question because oracleization and data availability do have some similarities and overlap, especially if you're providing the data in a decentralized way. Um, could you speak a little bit to how the pro projects are distinct from one another and how you see them branching off a bit over time? Sure. Um, just one small correction is I, I don't think we solve the problem of data availability per se. Usually I think of data availability as like a layer one concern, which basically means that like you're guaranteed that you'll be able to get the data, that the data doesn't drop off. That, and, and that's like an assumption that we make of all of our data sources and that essentially what uh, we're solving is kind of quality of service. So it's I want to be able to access the data quickly and cheaply and um, securely. Uh, and, um, and so that's like a layer that goes on top. If one uh, graph node doesn't 
send you a response, you can just hit another graph node. Um, they're very kind of like interchangeable. Um, uh, but then uh, in comparison with Chainlink, I kind of think of us as maybe like two sides of a coin or we're kind of opposite. Chainlink is kind of a way of getting data on chain and we're kind of a way of getting data off chain. Um, so it's kind of cool. Uh, they're both these kind of, you could almost think of them as like layer two networks that kind of sit on top of um, you know, these like blockchains and storage networks. Yeah, so um, basically in order to achieve decentralization, to achieve data availability, I think it's very important to have something like, basically you need, in order to have decentralization, to have as many actors as possible, right? So you need node operators who are providing this data to be incentivized and to have a reason to act honestly, basically to provide the data as they should provide it. So not to lie or not to act maliciously. So in order to do this, you have to have mechanisms such as staking. Basically someone has something at stake, right? So if you have a security deposit in tokens, basically saying, all right, if I start lying, well, the other nodes will show that I'm lying because they provide the right data, I'll provide the wrong one, so I might get slashed, right? So you need to have kind of incentives for node operators to first act in a not Byzantine way, I don't know how to say it, <laughs> and also to keep their nodes running as much as possible, so having uh, the best uptime possible, and that's also incentive, so it's having the right game theory, the right economic system in place to make sure that a network like this can function. Thank you very much. Um, coming back to over here, and we'll have a few that run across the board, but um, talking uh, uh, inter-blockchain uh, connectivity communication, um, Billy mentioned in his talk that the next big piece for Cosmos was IBC. Um, do you see standards evolving uh, over time? Or will every uh, uh, IBC-related project need to find their own way to uh, interconnect? You know, if you were at the um, Interchain Conversations event, the first question that Jay got on stage was, uh, when Etherbridge? So uh, will, will IBC possibly handle this over time across both projects, or, or how will that shape up, in your opinion? I mean, it's always difficult to judge any future scenario. Uh, the way that I kind of imagine things happening with IBC, I mean, in a way, this also speaks to what, what is IBC and what is supported with IBC. And um, first off, I got to say that when I joined Cosmos, I don't think I fully understood why Cosmos exists. <laughs> uh, and it took me a while to fully grasp exactly like what problem they were even solving. And, and in a way, I was really excited by somebody who's trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist yet. Uh, but there was a lot of sort of early comparisons too between what Polkadot was doing and what Cosmos was doing and this idea of uh, communication between blockchains and, and a go-to factoid would be something like uh, Cosmos will support uh, transfers of balances and Polkadot will support arbitrary state updates. Um, and in a way this is true, uh, but what I came to realize later was that this idea of uh, data transfers as uh, message types so uh, the first message type that would be supported with IBC is a uh, transfer of coin. Uh, this includes coins like non-fungible tokens, though. So in a way, these are two message types. Um, and when you're talking about autonomous chains that are application-specific, um, in a way, the only part that really matters between those two are stores of value. Um, and so when you have a chain that's designed to do exactly what it does, but it needs to sometimes, say, do something to some other chain, almost every situation can be sort of uh, boiled down to a transfer of value. Uh, but what I became aware of a little bit later as well is that so much of IBC is based on the work from Agoric, who's been uh, sort of the inventors of the smart contract. They've been working in this sort of context for 20 years. And uh, a message type that is very much on the runway is uh, a call data message type. So this would be sort of a smart contract execution message type, which basically opens up any other sort of arbitrary state update transition that, that could be imagined through a message type. Um, I, I actually think it'll be sort of underutilized, though, because of sort of the beauty and elegance that comes through the abstraction of actual transfer of values between into chains where, where the things that matter, sort of arbitrary state updates, actually are already designed to take place on the single chain that they were designed to take place on. Um, so that's related to your, your topic. 
but do you want to steer it more in one direction or another, or should I just hand off the mic? You could start, <laughs> start with a hand off, and then come back if need be. The, the question was really, um, uh, speaking to uh, uh, IBC, do you think a standard will emerge over time uh, 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 that helps utilize some of the signs between the projects uh, 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 to, to interconnect to each other, back to uh, uh, other chains uh, with other IBC projects? Or can you use the microphone? Yeah. You've, you've heard the question. So. Can you repeat the question? It's the initial question, just sort of re repeating the initial question. Okay, so um, so uh, the to the answer, like initially when Billy mentioned that um, it's still uh, we cannot comment a lot on what's coming in the future. Uh, it's it's I fully agree with that. Um, on the other side, like Polkadot is uh, already having um, a protocol called ICMP, Interchain Message Passing, which is uh, different from IBC, and uh, it basically like allows arbitrary message passing. Now I'll go to go back to uh, the uh, one of the things that I mentioned in my talk is like the infrastructure for infrastructure. So what ICMP is uh, allowing for a change to actually define standards on what kind of messages to be passed. It's like we are not enforcing chains to you should be only doing uh, a data call or you should be doing only doing a, a coin transfer or anything. It's like uh, we are providing a base uh, protocol and an infrastructure. And uh, the chains uh, or the developers out there who are building their platforms and um, uh, frameworks on top of it are fully free to decide which kind of messages to be passed, what should be standardized. Should it be uh, should there be a standard for a coin transfer? Should there be a standard for uh, an arbitrary message or something like that? It's fully up to them to design and implement and come up with it. Uh, having said that, um, there are other teams also who are looking into inter-blockchain communication, like I was talking to some of them uh, in this week, and there is definitely um, like a lot of uh, overlap between these protocols, and there are a lot of differences, and it will be really interesting to see how we are able to you know, uh, combine those overlaps and still convert some of those differences to uh, reach a consensus on, the, on that, but still very early days, I would say. Just quickly, um, so I, I'm excited to hear about this sort of process on Polkadot, which sounds to be mirroring a bit the process of IBC, which is sort of uh, beginning with certain message types and working through what those message type support would look like on different chains. Uh, I mean, we've also talked between the projects about the fact that Polkadot would be able to support IBC if it chose to and be able to send messages from the Polkadot ecosystem out into the wider interchain, uh, vice versa. Uh, your, your sort of version of IBC is very much for communicating between different parachains, right? Uh, I, I'm curious what the design decisions are between IBC and your own version of it that are specific to Polkadot that wouldn't be possible to sort of incorporate into uh, using IBC uh, for all communication, whether it was between parachains or to the wider interchain. Sure, uh, I, I'll be very quick actually on that because I uh, I do not have that level of detailed expertise uh, to compare uh, IBC and ICMP, but what I can actually say is that um, uh, you are right. Uh, IBC will be just a subset or layer on top of that if that needs to be supported in the future. So it's, it's still an underlying protocol which uh, can basically, if we uh, devise a standard which has uh, the standard of IBC messages, then they can still be passed among the parachains. So that's how I'll just uh, quickly close this. Okay. So the topic tonight was uh, uh, interoperability. And uh, coming back to this side of the uh, semicircle, um, how, I'm curious, do you react to this sort of answer? You guys have spent the last few years with the projects um, working to, sure, bring data on and export data from uh, the Ethereum chain. Um, is this like starting over for both projects, uh, uh, for each, let's say, inter-blockchain uh, inter communication protocol? Um, or would you benefit from a standard, or is it simple plug-and-play? Um. At the end of the day, I think it's it's very likely to be like a very heterogeneous multi-blockchain kind of world, um, and we've kind of been prepared from from for that from the beginning. We started with Ethereum just because it has the most active ecosystem. Um, we really um, you know uh, identify with the project, uh, but I think uh, either way, uh, software is going to run on a lot of different chains, and so. Um, for us, we want to like organize all of the data from these different chains, and we think that applications are going to utilize data from uh, multiple chains. 
And so um, actually like organizing that data, it's, it's not really like the classical interoperability problem. Right? The, the problem that like Cosmos and Polkadot solve is much more around, uh, I want to update state across different chains. Um, and so for us, there's an aspect of it where it's, it's you know, less tied to security in the, in the sense that um, you, know, you can't make like a, a, an incorrect state transition you know, using the graph, uh, but still linking the data across different chains. So uh, you know, if you have like a, an interface and in your app you want to show you know, all of the jobs that you can perform and um, you know, those, those jobs are pulling data from different protocols that are living on different chains, you still want a way to very efficiently get that data, put it up on an interface, and that's kind of the, the part of the problem that we solve. Yeah, I mean, uh, very similar. Like, I think this panel and uh, this, this talks were great because we had two sides of the equation. We had this one side where it was interoperability between blockchains and the other side between real-world data, right? So bringing this real-world data over to blockchains. Now, on our side, like, technically, it's very different from um, the IBC, but, and basically being able to communicate across blockchains, but once we have pulled this data from the real world to blockchain applications, we also plan to be blockchain agnostic, right? Which means that we don't want to only have smart contracts living on Ethereum. We want to have smart contracts living on Cosmos, on Polkadot, and all of them being able to communicate. So I think having a standard there is uh, very key. So we, we all know about TCPIP, and TCPIP was created by a consortium of enterprises, businesses, uh, researchers who kind of work together to create this standard and I think it's very important in the blockchain space to have uh, something similar like we can pull real-world data without having like with having um, standards that are established you know and we need the same to kind of make this data flow across different blockchain networks so that's very key to having uh, non an interconnected blockchain world where we can across we can communicate across the real the real world and blockchains. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have uh, uh, two more uh, quick questions, and then I believe Maurice will lead uh, a few from the audience. Um, going to move quickly to everybody's favorite subject, uh, 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 token economics. So, or lack thereof. So. Uh, uh, quickly across the board, and I'll hand off the mic so that you can sort of pass across. Um, Cosmos seems to utilize one system where heavily incentivized taking, uh, but it's not required uh, ecosystem-wide if you move off of the hub, whereas Polkadot, I believe, is the other side of the coin. It's highly incentivized use to keep the uh, uh, entire system interconnected in that way. Um, I'm curious to hear about uh, uh, how... Uh, going back and forth here, uh, Chainlink's uh, uh, token, token economic model was, I don't think it's something we heard about in this presentation, and how the graph pulls off what you guys do without it. So uh, I'll, I'll go, let's go this way. This time. Chainlink, basically we are relying on a decentralized network, right? So any decentralized network, uh, in order to establish trust, we need to kind of have game theory and token economics to make sure that the actors providing the data are incentivized to provide it uh, in a reliable manner, right? So basically the way it works with the chain link, once, once everything will be kind of figured out on this side, so in a few months we'll start implementing staking, which means that people will, or there is no date on this one, but basically people will need to, uh, we need to have a security deposit of link tokens to ensure that basically they have something at stake, right? Kind of similar to staking on Cosmos and Tezos when you're um, committing to saying that this state is the right one. If you're providing data to the Chainlink network, you need to have something at stake when you're doing it. And basically these data, these oracles will be paid by the user's contract. So someone who is pulling data from an oracle will have to pay this oracle using the link token. So basically the more reputation you have, so kind of first one, the more staking, the more staking you have, it means that you have more security deposits, so more to lose. So your reputation is kind of more important, right? Because you're more reliable in this way if you have more, more at stake. And second one, um, kind of people who have been providing, so node operators who have been providing this data for a long time will have a bigger reputation, which means that they will be more um, likely to be chosen by smart contracts uh, owners who want to query data from them. So 
uh, that's I think our token economics is very similar to any decentralized network uh, that's using uh, staking, for instance. Like, uh, there are no, like, we haven't found the right approach. I think no one has. It's still a space that's being explored, right? It's a very new space. Uh, so it's kind of similar, and we'll try to experiment and see what works. Yeah. Um, I think we've probably talked about our token less than like maybe any other protocol that I know about. Uh, we haven't launched a token yet, um, but uh, there is a token as, as part of our protocol design. And that's just because uh, we made the decision early on that we wanted to solve like pressing problems for developers and we would start with that first and that we would kind of decentralize over time. Uh, so what we looked at today in the demo was us running our hosted service. We're running a bunch of the nodes, and it's basically centralized. Um, all the code is open source. If you want to run your own nodes, you can, or you could just rely on our nodes um, to, to make your life easier for now. Uh, but the goal is the decentralized network. And so it's kind of this trust we're taking on with the community to say, you know, we're starting with this set of problems first. Uh, we want to make it really usable. We want to make life really easy for developers. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll be decentralizing as a subsequent step. Um, along those lines, at Graph Day, uh, it's this event that we held in January, we, op we uh, like published our specs for our hybrid network, which is the next milestone. Uh, for, for us, and in the hybrid network, um, anyone externally will be able to run a graph node uh, as part of this network. Uh, we are going to release uh, you know, the token in that milestone. Um, and, uh, and so we, we, we published uh, the, um, the specs for this intermediate milestone, where um, the graph is still responsible for some elements of security in the network, but the economics are decentralized, so uh, you can earn money by running a graph node. Uh, and basically, the token has two uses in the network. Um, there's a work token model, so it's uh, very similar to like a live peer, for example. Uh, if you want to run a node, you have to stake graph tokens, and that uh, provides the economic security. So if you misbehave, then you're slashed. Uh, and, and then uh, in return, as a node, you can set uh, fees per query in uh, another currency like Ether DAI. So we're explicitly not like a medium of exchange token. Uh, and so this creates like an open uh, marketplace where anyone can run a node, set their own prices, and uh, that should make a service that's uh, reliable and, and cheap. Uh, for people. Uh, and then the second use of the token is for staking on subgraphs themselves. Um, and so there's a few pieces uh, in kind of like the governance and how we, de how, how we manage uh, essentially this global graph of data where people want to organize data and come up with standards for data formats in a way that's decentralized. Um, and so there's a governance component to that. And then also there's like a revenue share component where if you stake on a subgraph, then you can earn um, some portion of the query fees for your curation work. Um, so uh, those are things that are part of our, our hybrid network spec, which is going to be the next phase for our protocol, uh, which is um, on our GitHub at uh, graph protocol slash research. Thank you, thank you. Cool. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I am a fan of this idea of like um, decentralizing as there's value there. Uh, if you try to decentralize too early and there's not value on your network, it's, it's a huge security vulnerability. You can attack a network that has no value. So I, I really appreciate that spec coming from you all. Um, in a way, it also has similarities to the way we think about token economics at Cosmos uh, because uh, Atom is meant to be a staking token. It's not meant to be a store of value. It's not meant to be a fee token. Right now, Atom is a, uh, Cosmos is a hub that only has one token on it. So it is used as the fee token. Uh, but we want to make atoms as illiquid as possible because that will make it as hard as possible to attack the network because if it's easy to buy one third of the, the stake that's on the network, then it's easy to attack the network. But if there's just not even one third for sale at any given moment, it's going to be impossible to accrue enough to make an attack like that. So our primary goal is making the token illiquid. Uh, one of the ways we do that is with staking rewards, which are very different from rewards on a proof of work mining, where you think of getting paid for running your, your node. If you find the block reward, you know, that's your payday. That's very much the opposite on, on Cosmos. We, we mean it to be an inflationary token. It basically means if you're not staking your token, the value of it is dropping every second that someone gets a block reward because the, the quantity of tokens out there is constantly increasing. If you're not part of that increasing by delegating your stake to a validator or validating yourself, that means the value of your tokens are constantly dropping. So that is supposed to encourage you to delegate them, to stake them, 
lock them up. Do not let them be on the open market because if they're available, that means the market and the network is unsecure. Uh, the Atom is supposed to give you rights as a validator to accept fees. This is where we see the value of the network going through, which is why we also very much depend on people wanting and using blockchains. This is something that I like strongly believe in. It's, it's a time to finally test. Like uh, We have the tools and the ability to build scalable blockchains. Now let's see if anybody wants to use them, because if there's actual value out there, those, those fees from that value will be what those validators actually want and what actually get paid from. Uh, so uh, something like the one thing that I find very common in, in all of these token designs is proof of stake. Uh, the world is moving to the staking side of things now. And um, now the thing is with Polkadot, we again have a proof of stake system, but um, what we call uh, it and it's uh, how it is slightly different from uh, generally proof of stake or delegated proof of stake. It's like uh, it's called nominator proof of stake uh, basically or nominated proof of stake. It's called NPOS and uh, the way it works is uh, that not everybody needs to run a node to get block rewards. Uh, you can actually uh, nominate a, a, a potential validator to act uh, with your stake and they can stake into the network and uh, run a node. Uh, the second most important thing is uh, when these validators join the network, they actually are um, uh, changed or shuffled every set period of time, which is called a session. So um, they and at that particular time, the block rewards are distributed. So that's one uh, utility of the uh, dot token for Polkadot that you stake uh, your dot tokens to become a validator on the network and you can nominate your dot tokens to, uh, for someone else to become a validator so that you can share rewards with them. Uh, the second uh, utility is uh, getting parachain slots themselves. So you have to uh, stake uh, uh, dot tokens to um, get a parachain slot on the uh, relay chain and then you can actually be a part of that uh, whole Polkadot network which allows you to participate into the uh, message passing and the pool security security and all the goodness of the relay chain. Uh, there is no concept of gas or fee per se. It's, uh, if you have a parachain slot, you are actually allowed to be uh, part of the network processing the um, transactions uh, along with the other validators and uh, message passing. And in your chain yourself, you are completely free to uh, uh, how you want to uh, have your token economics. It doesn't have to be, um, if, for example, there are use cases like uh, NGOs and governments where you do not want your users to be paying for transactions, they should be using your network um, as, a, um, as a free service, then you are um, uh, good with that as well. You do not need a token, a local token economics in your parachain. And in case you want a fee or subsystem or something like that, for example, the smart contract parachain being built on Polkadot called Edgeware, they will be having their um, fee concept inside their particular chain. So it's very uh, segregated and different. Uh, on the Polkadot network, it's the dot token doing uh, all these uh, several um, things and being used for that and for a local parachain it uh, may, or may not be something else yeah yeah all right so the last one is a fun one uh you can keep it relatively short uh if you'd like uh there were two comments made up here one was that uh, uh when they joined uh, someone here joined their project they thought it was a, a problem a solution in in search of a problem and the other one was mentioned by a solution for a problem that didn't exist yet Okay, still fits the question. And multiple people up here mentioned uh, uh, not to speculate about the future. So let's do both. Uh, I, uh, hearing, hearing these critiques, uh, I'm involved in the Ethereum community, so I'm wholly unfamiliar. But uh, these uh, uh, projects are coming of age, right? And while it may still be a few more uh, 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 insert weeks, months, soon, trademark years, uh, before Polkadot v2 or phase two of Serenity is online or IBC is live with lots of uh, folks in the zones and uh, 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 your projects have come to fruition. Um, can you give a brief uh, real world example for either those here that may be slightly less technical or some that may watch this feed of uh, uh, how the project envisions uh, its use in the future if those things have come to mind for you? And we'll go uh, this way again. Yeah, sure. Um, so, actually, the vision of Chainlink is really to replace detailed agreements by smart contracts. So, for this, we need a lot of data. We need a system of decentralized oracle which is secure, which is reliable. Um, I think a good example of uh, how we see move things moving forward is the integration we had recently with uh, Google, which is going to use BigQuery 
which is going to use Chainlink in order to pass BigQuery data onto uh, the Ethereum blockchain. So that's, I think, yeah, I'm lucky because it was announced a few days ago and it's a perfect example. So, <laughs> um, we, we aim to see a lot more businesses using Chainlink in order to solve problems that can be solved with smart contracts. So uh, DocuSign in, is another partnership we got. Uh, their CEO is an advisor to Chainlink. And we'll see a lot more enterprises using Chainlink in order to leverage the power of, mass, of smart contracts. Basically, it's in insurance, in finance, and in trade finance. All of these fields will be very disrupted by smart contracts. To be disrupted, they need to transfer the data to the blockchain, and they will use Chainlink to do this. So, um, so if, if we're successful, the graph will be like a global API um, for just like all the world's structured information. So if you want to build an application, you go to the graph and you find all of the data that you need to build your app really quickly, you deploy it, and it just runs forever. Um, as far as kind of the space as a whole, um, I really subscribe to the kind of sovereign individual uh, sort of view of the world where, you know, it, and everyone can design their own jobs. You know, I could build my own custom application. That's just how I want to spend my day. I clock in. I find the type of uh, jobs that I want to do. Um, you know, people are matched in this global open marketplace. And, um, and that's somewhat what the future of, of work looks like. Um. I recently asked um, Chris Goes, who's heading the research on IBC, would it be possible to run a single server validator that supported IBC? Uh, because it made me think about sort of the original spec for HTTP that was supposed to support a standard for value transfer. Uh, and they, they just couldn't figure out how to solve the double spin problem. Um, and sort of the, the end game that I kind of see with the internet of blockchains or the inner chain is a, uh, a network, a, an internet of computers where money is a primitive. Uh, instead of being a number in a database that is going to rely on a, a merchant service to redeem that value later on, you just have a much more efficient computer system where money itself is as important as a Boolean or a string uh, when you're programming. And you can, you can rely on this fact that money is, is real in the software level. And what's required for that is something like IBC, which is you know, a standard for transferring value between different computation systems, whether it's the most boring case, say a, a single validator on a chain or <clears throat> a public validator set on a public blockchain. The idea that you could support that as a, a computer network is, is where I think sort of the end game lies. Cool. So uh, for Polkadot, um it's kind of something uh, similar, but it's uh, in a, so a slightly different way. Uh, again, if we are successful, and we will be, um, we are looking at basically a, a, a world which is more uh, connected. We, uh, for example, let me give you an example of a, a real world. Uh, there will be chains doing uh, very different things and doing them very efficiently, very well. Uh, if I want to book, uh, book a flight and I want to book a hotel and I want to book a taxi and those are all being done on different chains, they will be, uh, I don't have to like rely on their uh, calling them separately or I don't have to uh, basically authenticate my identity for each of them. I don't have to make payments on each of them, I will be basically able to do that. Uh, payments on one chain, uh, uh, who I am, where is my digital passport on one chain, and similarly booking a plane ticket and a hotel on the other chain and so on. So it's, it's basically going to be a lot more connected, uh, less bloated, and a lot more transparent uh, when we succeed, hopefully. All right, thanks everyone, and I'll hand over to Maurice for a few from the audience, however many you feel you have time for. There was one very eager center in the back here in the white shirt. Sorry for being too eager. Um, I also think you led with the right question. You asked me earlier, like, what is the most important question? I think sort of highlighting that difference between the different projects was very interesting. Um, but to this first topic, like, what does the standardization of IBC look like? Um, and so, so as a bit of, like, I worked very closely with Tendermint back up to 2017. Um, and we're launching like a first real world use case in 2000, uh, like in two weeks, um, an application with like 25 million users. Um, but so, I mean, we're launching first to 3,000 <laughs> and 90,000, so, but steady. Um, but I mean, we had to look at this problem also. How do we communicate between side chains? 
and Ethereum mainnet. And so maybe it's more of a proposal like we, you have EIP 712. And so what we communicate is hash data according to EIP 712. We store it in one contract. We prove that it exists in the outbox on Ethereum mainnet. And now we, we pass whatever message. So we have a message struct and then a specific type struct that sits in that message struct. But we just use EIP 712. So maybe an ID. Instead of like trying to invent another standard, there already exists one. An idea rather than a question. It's OK. Thank you so much. Maurice, to the next. Uh, so this, isn't, this is also not really a question, but um, <laughs> <laughs> We have um, comments so there, from the audience. Uh, so there is a standard for IBC that's currently being worked on by multiple companies. And actually, uh, at the last community call, uh, a researcher from Web3 Foundation actually participated in the call. So if you want to participate, then you're more than welcome to. The, there's a GitHub repo. It's Cosmos slash ICS. And then actually, also, the Polkadot um, wiki has a good explanation of it. And then there's also... Right now, four implementations, Haskell, that's being worked on, Haskell, JavaScript, Rust, and Go. Cool, thanks. Yeah, the meetup is also supposed to be kind of an exchange, so that's perfect. Do we have some more questions? Uh, my question is more regarding like getting data on-chain and off-chain, and I'd like to understand, because it seems to me that this is more or less a subset of just the off-chain compute environment. And in both cases, both in Graph and in Chainlink, you require having these decentralized networks. And why do they always have to be separate? Why do you have to build a network every single time when you can just build a generalized application that requires, for example, in my case, I want inputs from five validators, and that can be the five APIs that I'm requesting, but also I can run it as many nodes as I want. And I only have to run it on, let's say, the iExec network. Why do I have to limit myself to a subset of API requests that either Chainlink or Graph offers and not be able to write a generalized spec, such as, let's say, a Kubernetes one? Well, I, I think you're right that you know generalized compute is kind of a, a reusable kind of primitive. Um, but I also think that all of these different use cases have enough differences when you get down into it, where um, especially because we're so early in the evolution of these protocols, they kind of need the ability to evolve separately because uh, it's just really hard to coordinate large number of engineers together. And so like even within a single team, you know, you kind of break things up into like modules or something, right? You want to have something that's a small enough box that there's like one team or something that can like own that box and, and make changes independently. And I think that the general concept of like protocols that are specialized that layer on top, uh, I, th I think is a good one. Um, you know, modular I think is better than monolithic in general for these types of things. Um, now, as a node operator, maybe it turns out that y you're an enterprising node operator and you say, you know what, I can actually ingest the same data um, from these like seven different you know networks, run nodes for these you know five different networks on top, and I can do that really efficiently, and that way I'll make even more money. Uh, because actually, you know, the data ingestion part is very similar. The data I have to store, the computation maybe is like somewhat reusable and you can find a way to do that. And I think people should experiment and uh, I think there's opportunities for those kinds of optimizations. Uh, but as far as like the specs and the networks themselves, I just think that like, you know, we're, we're kind of building an operating system here. It's like, you know, all of the different pieces are super complex and we just have to, you know, uh, draw boxes around the various components so that we can kind of get it done. Yeah, I fully agree with you. It's a very new space. It's very hard to define a generalized application. In this one, I think the modular approach is much safer and uh, much better to basically for the future. That's, I fully agree with you. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the interoperability. So currently when developing a web app, for example, and I want to use a single blockchain, then I already have this issue that I need a blockchain wallet, I need some plugin like MetaMask, and now if I imagine that we have a plethora of different competing blockchains, I would need uh, yeah, numerous uh, wallets as well if I don't want to have uh, the power at this central web app server. So uh, have you thought of any kind of um, yeah, of combined wallet that, that allows you to um, use those different blockchains from web apps, for example, as well? So uh, I read an article recently from Richard Moore, who, if you don't know him, is, is a, a great researcher, mostly associated. He's, he's the image of Ethers.js and a few different projects. 
And he was writing sort of a speculative article about how do you future-proof your blockchain for the quantum computing uh, world. And quantum computers are really good at doing very specific things, but not everything. One of the things they're really good is sort of breaking um, encryption on private keys. What they're really not good at doing is dealing with BIP32 mnemonic phrases. So there's nothing that would prevent you from using the same mnemonic phrase on many different curve architectures. And also, it would sort of keep you future-proof from a quantum world. Uh, I'm not sure which wallets are currently supporting uh, different curve outcomes from BIP32. Uh, I know that Cosmos supports uh, the same curve as Ethereum. The way that MetaMask handles it is slightly differently in order to sort of recover the public key. So there might be some tweaks there, but uh, somebody from MetaMask was here for the weekend at the Cosmos Hackathon sort of supporting the, the uh, grand goal, which I, I agree with you, is, is to be able to have you know, a unified uh, key management system across different worlds. And, and in a way, this is, I think, the most important thing because blockchains are cool and all, but what's really cool, I think we can all agree on, is cryptography. And what it's done is made a reason for people to care about strong encryption. It's made a reason for people to have private keys, to be aware of what they are, to think about what that means, to think about multi-signatures, to think about all these really important schemes that are extremely powerful. Uh, it's only until we have something that we need to secure do we care about securing them. And, and I, I agree with you that I think this is sort of uh, the most important component of no matter what blockchain you are. It's, it's where the, the tires hit the road. It's where the humans touch the technology. If there are no more questions, I would say thank you. And thank you all so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much Thanks for, for this panel. great panel.